Welcome back to the next lecture, everybody. In this one, we are going to tackle HIV. A quick stat for you. Um, 1.2 million people in the U.S. are living with HIV. Around 14% of them do not know they have it. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. Let's get started. Now, when it comes to screening, anybody who has a risk factor should get yearly screening. But the ideal amount of screening would be every three to six months in an ideal setting. Now, some of the big risk factors you want to keep in mind include men who engage in sexual activity with other men with an unknown or positive HIV status, those in the sex work industry, anybody using uh, IV drugs, or really anybody who's engaging in what might be considered as unsafe sexual practices. In my mind, anything unsafe would be um, engaging in sexual activity without using appropriate protection, meaning uh, barrier contraception, like condoms. Um, now, if someone does not have risk factors, they should be tested at least once in their lives. Anybody who's pregnant should be screened at the start of their pregnancy. Now, the recommended screening test is the fourth generation combination HIV-1-2 amino assay, and we will confirm a positive result of that with an antibody differentiation assay. Now, between two to four weeks following exposure to HIV is when patients are most likely to develop symptoms that are characterized as what we would call acute symptomatic HIV infection, period. Many patients will remain, though, completely asymptomatic. But those that do show symptoms are likely to have many nonspecific complaints that are really seen in a wide variety of viral infections. So fever, myalgias, arthralgias, nothing that's going to make you automatically think HIV. Uh, typically, the history is what's going to maybe tip you off a bit. Now, lymphadenopathy may also be present and is typically going to involve the axillary, cervical, and occipital nodes. And the lymphadenopathy that's seen in acute symptomatic HIV is typically non-tender. Additionally, a rash may be present and most often is made up of oval or round pinkish to reddish colored macules um, that most frequently involve the face, the neck, and the upper chest areas. Now, the most characteristic finding, but one that isn't always present, is the finding of painful mucocutaneous ulcers. Now, even though this finding is rarer, it really helps set apart the acute symptomatic HIV infection from other viral infections, and so knowing some more details about these ulcers will be important for the Step 2 CK exam. So let's just talk real briefly about what they look like. Well, typically, like I said, they're found in the mouth. They can be found in the anus, on the penis, or in the esophagus, and they are described as having a very well-demarcated border with a white base that is surrounded by a thin area of erythema. And it's going to be a big clinical clue if a patient reports these findings. And the vignette also mentions something like IV drug use or chronic unprotected sexual practices. If that's all there, it can really help narrow down your diagnosis. Now, an early HIV infection presents with very high HIV RNA levels, almost always with HIV viral loads showing levels greater than 100,000 copies per mil. Now, additionally, it takes time for antibodies to form against the virus, and as such, it's very possible for early HIV infections to be identified with a positive viral load test, but a negative screening immunoassay. Now, just let me repeat that. A positive viral load test and a negative immunoassay could indicate early HIV infection. In this scenario, the patient is likely infected, but hasn't had time to form anti any antibodies yet. Now, this process of having no detectable antibodies to then having a patient having antibodies being detected on immunoassay, this is known as seroconversion. Now, the patient is seronegative when no antibodies are detected and seropositive when the antibodies can be detected. So, seroconversion occurs when an HIV antibody develops and becomes detectable in the blood. Now, with that being said, if an exposure occurred only a few days prior, say, for example, an individual had a needle stick or unprotected intercourse and they're worried about HIV, it is possible that both of these tests would be negative while an infection still does exist, right? It needs some time to, to, to develop. Detectable viremia doesn't typically develop until around 10 to 15 days after the infection, so individuals should be retested two weeks after the initial negative test if they are worried. So that... If the virus is present, there's enough time for it to become detectable uh, via these tests. Then at this point, another negative HIV screening immunoassay and negative viro uh, virologic test would indicate that an HIV infection is not likely present. Now, another common finding early on in HIV is a transient CD4 uh, cell count drop in relation to the increase in viral load. Then following the peak viral load, the CD4 count will begin to increase. And it takes approximately six months for plasma viral load levels to reach a steady state. 
All right, now let's move from the acute early phase of infection to chronic HIV infection. This period occurs following seroconversion before the patient enters into a severely immunocompromised state. And during this time, viral load remains relatively stable and patients experience a progressive reduction in CD4 count. Most patients are going to be asymptomatic during this period, but some will have what is called persistent generalized lymphadenopathy, whereby multiple lymph nodes will be swollen, enlarged, mobile, painless, rubbery, and usually located in the cervical, submandibular, occipital, and axillary chains. These patients are also more likely to experience a few different mucocutaneous conditions. Viral infections with HSV, VZV, and HPV tend to be more severe. Bacterial folliculitis occurs more commonly, and oral hairy leukoplakia, or oral or vaginal candidiasis, may also occur. Now, viral infections and candida are important considerations when diagnosing HIV patients who complain of either odinophagia or dysphagia. Now, patients who are not on antiretroviral therapy or who aren't responding to ART are at increased risk of dysphagia and odinophagia, as well as patients with AIDS and a CD4 count less than 100. Even with a CD4 count above 200, patients can suffer from dysphagia and odinophagia. Now, while there are many possible causes of dysphagia and odinophagia in a patient with HIV, by far the most common is candida. And for this reason, patients will be empirically given treatment with fluconazole before an endoscopy is performed. And patients should start to have uh, an improvement in their symptoms within about a week's time. But if they don't, this is when an endoscopy uh, with biopsy should be performed. Now, if HSV is detected, the treatment of choice is acyclovir. CMV treatment can be with gancyclovir, and aphthous ulcers are treated symptomatically. Now, a diagnosis of AIDS, of course, is made once the CD4 count drops below 200, or they have one of the AIDS-defining conditions, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, PCP, or esophageal candidiasis. So antiretroviral therapy, ART, it should be started as soon as possible because the earlier in the disease course it's initiated, the greater the chance of a return to normal immune function and the opportunity to return CD4 T cell levels closer to normal. Now, aside from this increase in CD4 T cells, the antiretroviral therapy helps to decrease the viral load, possibly even to undetectable levels. Now, as we'll get into in a moment, there are many possible side effects associated with ART, but even with the toxicity risk that these medications present, their utility so far, far outweighs the harms of an untreated HIV infection, even in the acute early stages of the illness. Now, additionally, by lowering serum viral load, the risk of transmission of HIV to other individuals also decreases. In addition to starting treatment as soon as possible, the treatment is also continued for the entirety of the patient's life. So while on ART, most patients will experience a near normal life expectancy. You also want to make sure that patients are tested for their individual HIV strains resistance to certain antiretroviral drugs, but uh, one of the three regimens would typically be appropriate regardless. Now, we will dive into the classifications and common side effects on the next slide, but for now, there are three regimens listed here in your books, and remember, they're going to be made up of a regimen that contains two different NRTIs plus an integrase inhibitor. This slide is a review from your step one farm, right? I'm not going to go through all of this information um, and read it out to you, but be sure you know the classifications of the drugs as well as the names for your exam. Um, that is going to be uh, relatively important. Um, HIV is pretty vast, but you definitely want to know uh, what drugs fall into which categories. All right, let's do a couple content review questions. I'll give you 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is B. All right, next question. 20 seconds on the clock, and then come on back. The correct answer here is C. All right, let's do one more question. I will give you 20 seconds. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back.
The correct answer here is A. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I'll see you guys on the next one.